All right, everybody. I think we'll get started. These panels are, are uh, on a pretty rapid schedule here with uh, 45 minutes, and we've got a great panel here. I want to give you guys a chance for Q&A at the end uh, as well, so let's get to it. Um, 4K ecosystem opportunities and challenges in the 4K workflow. Uh, I'm Joel Espelin. Uh, I'm a senior analyst at the Diffusion Group, which is a, uh, if you don't know, it is a really a boutique analyst firm focused totally on the future of TV. Uh, conveniently for this panel, uh, my most recent report uh, is on 4K, um, and it was called sort of forecasting the 4K ecosystem. You can check it out at uh, t tdgresearch.com um, is that site. You either look under my name or look under 4K. Um, and uh, um, you can um, take a look at that. So uh, obviously I have uh, some, some strong feelings and uh, beliefs about this, um, but uh, more importantly, we have a great panel with us today. Um, just very briefly, down here to my left, folks, you know, is Kanan Jinamili, the CEO of uh, DivX. Um, to his immediate right, we have uh, Nick Colsey, VP of BizDev, uh, and longtime 4K person at, Nick, at uh, Sony, and Keith Wimes, Chief Marketing Officer at uh, Elemental Technologies. So uh, three very knowledgeable folks in the 4K space. As you'll find, uh, Sandeep, who's up there, uh, could not join us today. He had to be in, uh, in Europe. So um, just to get started, uh, and then I'll take my seat with these, with these gentlemen. Um, uh, a couple things, I don't know, do we have a handheld microphone in the back for folks who have questions? Okay, cool. So feel free when we get to it um, at the end to uh, request a microphone um, or just speak up and we'll repeat the question for the uh, recording. Um, I thought maybe I'll just make a, a couple very brief introductory remarks, then we'll let each, folk, each uh, person just introduce themselves real briefly and then we'll just kind of get to a, a round table style discussion hitting uh, some kind of key topics, jumping around in the 4K sort of uh, value chain and workflow to kind of talk about opportunities and challenges that we see right now in terms of um, bringing 4K streaming to market. Um, so let me just take a seat with my friends here. You know, to summarize briefly, I think where we're at in in 4K, and obviously it's you know kind of preaching to the choir here at Streaming Media West, but I think it's a, a little bit important for us to step back as we enter this discussion and think about you know 4K in general. If you were to go back, you know, uh, a couple years, you would have seen um, I think you would have seen a very different perspective on 4K out there you would have seen a lot of talk about pay t traditional pay TV doing 4K demonstrations by broadcasters. I would say something that looked very old school, almost like what we saw when we saw HD roll out a decade ago. Um, and you know, obviously that's, that's not really playing out that way, right? That you know, ultimately there'll be trials and things. Um, there will be, uh, a, you know, ultimately there'll be some, pay, some 4K over pay TV. But it's going to take a long time. Um, that industry is certainly not rushing to embrace this. Um, and the second thing that we don't have in 4K at the moment, right, is we have no optical disc format, right? So we don't have phys physical itself, obviously, is declining. But even if physical wasn't declining, there are no 4K Blu-rays today. So we don't see physical strongly driving the format either, right? So maybe by next Christmas, Christmas of 2015, it looks like the Blu-ray Association has, has gotten its act together. Um, and, um, you know, I've certainly forecasted that that will help the ecosystem. But it's not a driver right now. So what does that leave, right? It basically leaves 4K in the hands of streaming, right? That if you're not going to stream 4K today, there is no 4K. So it, it's very, very different than what we've seen in the past in terms of of uh, new forms of quality in terms of streaming, um, you know, actually leading the way. But more importantly, remember, I see, you know, I see uh, some folks who've probably been in this industry a long time. You know, streaming and broadband always used to be, you know, sort of the poor stepchild of quality, right? I mean, you know, I know I see folks in the room who can remember back to, you know, tiny QCIF windows and 
you know, 10 frames a second on a real player right over, over dial-up, right? So, so the perception in the consumer's mind was always that broad the streaming was actually inferior quality, right, compared to television, which was great quality. We're turning that on its head right now, right, in terms of actually streaming 4K before 4K is available anywhere else. So that's also completely unique in the evolution of the video space um, previously. So, um, so all that being said, again, I've, I believe streaming is, is the driver of 4K for at least the next several years um, before uh, the, the pay TV industry sort of, you know, kind of gets its act together and there's enough mass market scale that that's even interesting. Um, and so what we're going to talk about is, is definitely, uh, you know, goes beyond just sort of this, this streaming niche, we're really talking about the entire 4K market when we talk about streaming 4K today. Um, the second thing I would just say, in terms of kind of my high level view is that um, 4K is a premium service, right? It is, it is not um, sort of just the next standard for video that you know, all video is gonna be in 4K. I think in a multi-screen world, um, <laughs> You know, streaming 4K to a phone, streaming 4K to a tablet, right, is, is pretty nonsensical. You have a huge installed base of legacy devices that won't ever support 4K. PCs aren't really a great 4K platform. So, you know, again, this isn't like just thinking about television going to HD or something. That 4K is going to be um, important, but it's going to be important primarily at the high end and primarily on, you know, that big screen in the living room where you can actually appreciate 4K, but it's going to coexist with other resolutions for uh, an extremely long time, um, both because of different screens, but also because of things like adaptive streaming and bandwidth limitations, right, where, where you're going to uh, ramp up and down. So, so that's quick in a nutshell, um, a little kind of, I feel like kind of background on how I approach 4K, so I don't consider myself either sort of a, you know, a pure cheerleader or certainly not a skeptic either. I think 4K is for real. Um, but I think we kind of have to put it in its proper context. So with that, I want to give my uh, esteemed panelists a chance to quick inter introduce themselves, um, maybe explain just sort of briefly what their role is for folks who aren't familiar with it, and then maybe just a brief comment on, on, um, on uh, you know, sort of what they're doing, um, what they're doing around 4K right now, just to kind of get us, get us warmed up and rolling. Um, Keith, feel free. Yeah. Yes, off. Uh, so Keith Wimes, I'm with Elemental Technologies, and Elemental is a uh, video processing and distribution software company, and we've uh, been around now for about eight years, last four years or so in the multi-screen market, and we essentially provide solutions that help um, either convert files uh, from one format to another, one compression standard to another, or uh, live streams um, and live channels into different formats, so we help basically media companies that typically deliver their video to a TV set, deliver it beyond the TV set to smart TVs and gaming consoles, tablets, uh, mobile devices. In the 4K space, um, we've been, uh, I think, over the last, essentially it's been almost the last year that we've been proving out essentially a number of milestones uh, in the 4K space, typically around the, the HEVC compression standard and uh, doing a series of, of firsts in the industry that were either demonstrations that were done uh, over time, and I'll, I'll go into some of those use cases as we talk, um, or actual real deployments. So there have been a number of deployments that are, have gone commercial, uh, particularly in the last um, number of weeks, and we are powering multiple ones of those uh, co commercial deployments. Um, and so we're getting to that point. I think it is really early, um, but it's clear that um, there's some reality to what's going on in terms of 4K, and I think there's some fundamental reasons why it's been fairly, fairly smooth, actually. I look back to the H.264 transition, and that was a bit bumpier, I think. So we can talk about some of the reasons for that um, later on. OK, Nick? And Nick Colsey, business development for Sony Electronics. Uh, so so uh, 4K has been um, uh, a key initiative for Sony Electronics ever since um, uh, the, you know, the start of digital cinema. Um, so we've. Uh, fitted um, 4K projectors and 4K uh, playback equipment in 13,000 digital cinema um, locations around the world. Um, 
and then more recently, since 2012, um, we've been a leader in 4K TVs. Uh, and it's been, been very important for us in order to, uh, uh, to take a lead in the, in the 4K TV market uh, to be able to offer 4K content to play on those 4K TVs. So uh, maybe later on I'll talk a little bit more about, um, about how we did that, but uh, being able to um, leverage all the different parts of Sony, um, Sony Pictures, um, Sony's uh, professional solutions group, as well as uh, the TV division. Has been uh, has been a key part of that. Great. Great. Um, hey, Kanan. Thank you, uh, Kanan Jamili. I'm a CEO of uh, DivX. Uh, most of you know probably DivX for uh, some years now, but uh, what you probably don't know is DivX now is a private company, as of the last uh, eight months, um, and we've been, as usual, very focused on uh, video, video, uh, advanced video, uh, specifically 4K uh, and HEVC. Uh, so DivX has been uh, really uh, pioneering some of the first things that happened. Uh, last uh, Q4 2013, actually, we launched our first consumer-based processing software for uh, converting content as well as playback of content on PC. Uh, at CES, uh, we, were, uh, we won an award for our encoding software for HEVC uh, with other partners. Um, and uh, we are uh, now actually focused uh, this year on uh, video delivery in, uh, in 4K. Uh, we have an end-to-end solution. Uh, we launched it in uh, IBC called OmniView. Um, it's very, it's uh, basically next generation. Uh, it's, it does support 4K, does support HEVC and Dash. It also um, uh, builds on the, uh, the, the strength of DivX, which is the play, playback on every device. Uh, we have uh, 1.4 billion devices that are, have our playback software out there. Uh, and we, we intend to um, push our 4K uh, solution into more devices as uh, the 4K uh, wave kind of, uh, um, uh, kind of forms uh, really this year, next year, and a few years, years ahead. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the things we're doing uh, uh, this quarter and, and next year uh, around 4K as we, as, we, as we talk more. So great. Um, so let's try to set a few baseline things. And I know we probably have a mixture in the audience. I know from streaming media, media um, West and East events, some folks probably uh, you know, highly technical and, and directly involved in doing video platforms at your companies. Other folks may be on the business side. But let's try to kind of lay down a, a sort of a baseline of, of understanding or consensus or lack of consensus um, you know, when, we're, when we're talking about 4K. So first thing, and we'll kind of do these rapid fire to see if we, if we have consensus or not. So Kodak for 4K, uh, HVC or versus anything else? Give me sort of a, a, a two-word answer. Keith? For distribution, HVC. Nick? HVC. Kanan? HVC, absolutely. So, you know, because you have seen a few people experiment with other things, right? But, but um, it seems pretty clear that when we're talking about 4K, we're talking about HVC. So streaming protocols. Uh, Dash or HLS for, for 4K? Keith? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Nick? Uh, yeah, I guess both. Dash, um, maybe a slight preference for Dash. Okay, Kanan? Uh, definitely Dash. Uh, some, some solutions will support HLS in the interim, given the latency in adopting Dash. Uh, but we, I think Dash will, uh, will, be, will be the format for uh, 4K, uh, would be the streaming format for 4K. Okay, so, you know, I think. Um, you know, we don't, have, we don't have any folks from our friends in Cupertino on the panel, so I think it'll be interesting to see what, what they have to say about, about um, Dash support versus trying to push HEVC over, over HLS. But definitely, I think the rest of the industry is kind of pushing towards Dash. So um, let's talk about, about data rates or profiles for a second when we talk about 4K. Um, you know, and think about it sort of... Um, well, let's start with it. Let's start with an easy one. What was sort of uh, real-world max data rate for 4K streaming? Keith, 35. 35. Okay. High bidder. Nick. Yeah, that is very bold. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, what we're seeing from um, uh, video aggregators who are streaming 4K to our TVs is, um, you know, around the sort of the 15 level. 15. Kanan. Uh, yeah, we've, in the U.S., to be successful, really, you need to be in the 15 range. 
Uh, I understand, you know, um, what Keith said about 35. I think in Japan and Korea, uh, there's um, a lot of areas where you have people are actually doing uh, 35 and 40 megabits per second uh, streaming. But as you bring it to the US, where it will be the largest market, it is the largest market for 4K. Um, you know, the 15 to 12 to 15 is where the range is. Um, and also, I think one thing we will talk about probably is 4K is not a one format. It's not 1080p, P24, P30. It, it's really a roadmap. I mean, you get 4K uh, with 30, 30 frames per second. You get HDR. You get, you know, kind of like, it's, it's a bunch of other uh, for things that are inside 4K. Uh, so when we talk about 15, uh, we're talking about what Netflix and perhaps others will do with 4, uh, P, 4K, P30, 8-bit. Um, you know, if you go to 10-bit, P60, then you're looking at a little bit more. Uh, so it, it is, 4K is not, it's not just one thing. And I right. think, um, you, know, you know. You did say max, though. No, I didn't say max. So <laughs> <laughs> I also said real world. So, uh, uh, so that was going to be the next question. Thing. Can I, um, perfect, perfect segue. So, um, you know, it's, uh, HDR and, and, and 10 bit, right? So as you said, so, so, uh, so as your choices are sort of, um, and then we have, and then we have uh, high frame rate as, as well. So I'll actually I'll give you a chance. We'll, we won't do that when it's quite, but, uh, give us your thoughts, and, and we'll give you the first chance on sort of um, how should we be thinking about that range of options within the 4K world, everything from kind of 30 frames a second, 8-bit, up to whatever craziness you would want to define at the high end, right? It could be 120 frames or, or something. So give us your thoughts on, on that menu of tools within the 4K world. How are you thinking about it right now, particularly with focus on uh, color depth, HDR, frame rate? For me, or yeah. Go ahead, Keith. Okay, um, so my my take on it is that it's going to evolve over time. So if you look at something like HDR, it's not really set in stone which way it's going to go. There are specifications from Dolby and the BBC and um, Technicolor and, and folks like that that have put forth their view of what additional color enhancement can mean, and they use different techniques. Some of them are, you know, essentially in band. Some of them are out of band. Um, our take, and part of my comment about the industry moving forward fairly quickly this time is around the fact that um, most of the solutions that are out there are, are software-based. And so it doesn't really matter that much whether or not one technology wins over another. We don't, we don't really care on the Dash side versus HLS side. Um, I tend to think it's both just because Apple will continue to be Apple. Um, but this also goes into 8-bit, 10-bit um, questions. We've shown our, the ability of our software to evolve to, to either one. Um, and then on the HDR side, that will continue to be true. And it'll be true of other elements of change that are occurring. Like one of the major things that is so, there's two major things I think that are really different about this shift. One is huge competitive um, threats that didn't even come close to existing in any of the last generation shifts that occurred. Um, and the second one is, the, is really the fact that um, you know, software is powerful enough to uh, be able to prove future proofing. Um, whereas in the past, software was always viewed as, well, I can do, I can do some of it, but it has its limitations. Mm -hmm. um, and this time, I think, you know, Moore's laws almost helped, caught helped leap a little bit, yeah. So Nick, so what sort of Sony's views on the that kind of high quality 4K question? Yeah, so looking at it from a TV manufacturer's perspective, um, you know, we have nine different models of 4K TV right now, and uh, you know, we, we had um, four models last year and one model the year before. So, uh, you know, we look at this uh, uh, both in terms of a roadmap of new capabilities coming along, uh, as well as um, the way um, people have traditionally bought CE equipment, which has been to look at um, different levels of performance and. Um, uh, the pricing for uh, for each of those levels of performance, and clearly there's a um, there's a high end uh, experience uh, which includes um, things like HDR, and uh, we've already started to uh, to show that with uh, uh, extended dynamic range uh, panel technology in our in our high end TVs right now. So today you can uh, you can go to Best Buy and see. Um, our flagship 4K TV, which has three times the brightness of um, 
uh, of a conventional LCD. Um, that's not end-to-end uh, -end HDR in the sense that we're talking about on this panel, um, but it does give uh, a view into uh, you know, what people are going to be able to experience in, in a few years' time when um, the complete workflow for, uh, for HDR is uh, hopefully standardized. Uh, so yeah, those kind of technologies, uh, increased uh, luminance, um, deeper colors, we're already using XV color or XVYCC, which is a, um, a step further from Rec. 709. And uh, you know, if you've seen some of the uh, professional products that, uh, that get closer to Rec. 2020, uh, you, know, you can really start to see, uh, see a difference there. Um, but all of these technologies still fall within um, uh, you know, what we look at as, uh, as 4K, there's still um, 4K resolution. And uh, uh, I think consumers are now starting to, uh, starting to understand what that means in terms of a um, picture quality benefit. And uh, that's, you know, that's, that's good news for a TV manufacturer because the number one thing that people, ask, people look for when going out and uh, buying a new TV is, uh, is better picture quality than they had before. So, Kanan, yeah. how, how, uh, how is DivX thinking about defining a, a 4K profile? Uh, so, we actually do, we, we, we did uh, define a, a profile this year for 4K. Uh, we defined profile one, and we're actually working on profile two now. Um, the first one was really based on technologies that are available today on, on TVs. We did launch a, um, a uh, premium content bundle with, on a consumer electronic device with the with with movie studios uh, that was based on 4K, uh, 30, 30p, uh, 10, 10, uh, 10, uh, 10 bits um, with uh, no SDR and uh, record 709. That's our first profile. Uh, but we think that the uh, the, the uh, 4K uh, is evolving with you know with the movies to, movies and TV uh, branch and there's the the other branch which is sports and action and so forth and um, um, I think the capturing at least with no HDR no uh, no color, color gamut um, with one, one or two profiles is is needed to actually launch some products in 2015 and this is where we see uh, the the sweet spot today. Um, the new, uh, the, the new uh, kind of advanced features of HDR and, and, uh, and color gamut would probably won't take hold into uh, consumer electronics or into the, uh, the workflow probably into 2016 to 17. Although, as Keith said, and there are some demos and there are some uh, special events that are happening in, in, uh, with higher contrast and higher, uh, higher, higher fidelity. Um, I think it's important that um, you know everybody remembers, of course, 3D uh, just a few years ago, or maybe not not that long ago. Um, adoption is key to uh, to any for new format. So we think 4K won't be like 3D; it will be more like HD because of the, the just the, the contrast and, and quality. So it's very important that the the industry kind of um, has a consensus around you know how to launch some certain products from the encoding to the processing to distribution also to devices. And I think we think that 2015 uh, is where we're going to see at least the first profile to take hold um, um, in, in, uh, in, in the consumer minds, whether they go to Costco or um, and buy a TV. It will, have, it will have a pretty good you know, uh, quality to it. They can actually buy it and also find content that they can stream to it. Uh so moving along, kind of hitting our, our uh, checklist of stuff that probably people are curious about. Let's do this one quick. We'll do another quick one. So um, screen size for 4K on a, on a television. Interested in the thoughts on the panel? This is sort of a minimum, Keith, not a maximum. Minimum. <laughs> minimum, uh, minimum screen size where you think 4K makes sense on uh, a consumer television. Keith? 55. Nick? Uh, 49. Kanan? 55. So we're all in a range, right? We're all in a range, but I was saying. What so was your answer? <laughs> uh, 27. 27. <laughs> no, but you really will close. see some. My point was, you will see some, some, you know, some real low-end products out there um, that I think are of questionable value to the consumer. I guess unless you sit two inches away from it, um, in in turn. But but yeah, my read I think is is similar that you need to be up in the in the. 49 to 55 range. Um, so, which again, 
people talk about 4K on a phone. I'm, I'm not sure what exactly they're talking about. Um, well, but you could have the 4K on a tablet de doing the decode and yeah. then it being displayed on a large set. I've seen that where it's almost like a substitute for a set-top box. You wouldn't watch it on the tablet, right. but it becomes like the decoding. Yeah. So doing a screen share. Yeah. Yeah, well, essentially like you share. shoot with the well, so 4K capture, camera. Right? Yeah. yeah, I talk about that in the report. So 4K capture on phones, we are going to see. The chipsets are there. Mm -hmm. Qualcomm's already shipping that chipset. Um, so 4K capture on a phone, but, um, but if you try to consume that on that same phone, you're not necessarily going to be able to even see the difference, right, what you just shot. But, but I do agree. Projecting that small screen phone on a big screen could be a very interesting use case. Um, so let's, talk, let's move on to uh, on-demand versus live around 4K. I know probably a favorite topic uh, of Elemental. So challenges around um, 4K workflow for on-demand content versus live content. Keith. Yeah, so I mean, we see, um, and I think most of what's been announced so far has been on the on-demand side, right? So we've done demonstrations that are end-to-end -end for live workflows. Um, but in terms of commercialization, you know, the little bit of commercialization that's gone on where you know, there are 20 or 30 titles available, those are all, all on-demand scenarios. And I think they're met, you know, meant to meet in some ways or neutralize the competitive threat that's been there for a few months. Um, whether or not it's big or not, I don't know, but obviously Netflix coming out and Amazon and, right. and Google saying they have 4K. You know, even if it's not a mass adoption, which clearly it isn't today, it still puts in people's mindsets that those companies are grabbing the, the kind of innovation um, mantra um, and kind of brand identity in the industry. Um, and so I think a lot of the reaction that we're seeing from you know, things like MGO and DirecTV and, and others are really to try to neutralize that for the time being. I think in the end, sports is a huge, you know, application that has to be live in some way um, in order for, for it to be really compelling for those that are really fans of the particular teams that they watch and over time it will become more and more live. But Well even in that on-demand context for those we just saw in the keynote you're talking about one minute. All right, so you get, I guess you get one minute to encode it right for the highlight these days. Yep. So it's near live yep. right yep. even for those type of cases. So mm -hmm. Nick, your thoughts um, from Sony perspective on uh, where we're at sort of in maturity, if you will, on uh, on-demand um, versus the, the realistic prospects of live 4K? Yeah, so we've showed uh, live um, 4K demos. We, we had one at, uh, at NAB. Um, so, you know, it's, it's definitely possible today. Um, and that was over, um, uh, you know, over a fiber link from, from New York to, uh, to Las Vegas, uh, but with the last mile just going through a standard um, cable MVPD's uh, infrastructure. So, um, you know, it's, it's very, very, very doable um, right now. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's what's really going to open it up. Um, you know, the first um, football games or um, uh, baseball games that are, that are shown live in 4K, that's going to be a uh, a real milestone in the in the adoption of 4K. So, Kanan, thoughts today? Sort of degree of difficulty on demand versus live 4K for streaming. Um, I think streaming from from a CDN into the home is is the same. That, that piece of delivery for either on, on demand or, or live. Um, but I agree that you know getting the signal out of an arena into uh, into the um, into the cloud down to the people's homes is, is still a challenge. Um, and even if you, especially if you get to the 15 megabit per second um, type of uh, processing, uh, that's still kind of, hopefully it's, we're not that far off, probably a year to, to, to a year and a half. We're probably gonna see more uh, small events that are filmed and uh, broadcast live, but not on a broad scale. It would be some niche, um, niche games or maybe some showcase games that are gonna, we're gonna see um, on demand, obviously, there's a lot of uh, press around. Uh, um, you know, as Keith said, Amazon, Netflix, MGo, and so forth, uh, doing things in early 2015. Um, they can. That, that's probably easier to do because it, the prep time for these files is is very long. But but if you're, if you're on demand, then you're fine. Uh, I think live is going to be um, the challenge here. Yeah. Um, so so back to Keith. This one, in case we get a, a follow up. So, you know, clarify for me and for the rest of the audience. So today, 4K, 
uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, can I, Nick, you can join as well, uh, sort of software versus GPU or, or hardware assist. Um, yeah, so today, the, in order to get to real time, we do, um, you know, we, well, we're a software company, so everything is software, uh, but to do real time 4K P60 HEVC 10 bit, um, it does require the acceleration of, of graphics processors. Um, we cannot do that on a standard off the shelf CPU based platform. Okay. Um, so everything that we've done over the last, basically over the last year, we've gone from kind of on demand processing of 4K P30 content HEVC to getting to real time P30 and then eventually to P60 uh, in the January timeframe this year. Okay. So those demonstrations that we've done at the Olympics uh, at NAB when we were doing it over, over the internet, um, World Cup work that we did, right. um, that was all software on general purpose systems. It, it's not FPGA or, right. or ASIC based. Approaches. So are you saying, but are you saying real time P30 today on off the shelf hardware? P60 today, off the shelf. Absolutely. Well P60 with GPU. With GPU. But yeah. without GPU, what's the limit today? Uh, From you guys uh, actually, I don't even know. We haven't tried okay. to process okay. without it. So, Kanan, any thoughts today? Sort of GPU or hardware assist versus off versus just sort yeah. of off-the-shelf standard hardware for the, uh, encode. Yeah, I think for, um, you know. I think 4K P30 is possible on on, hard, on, on off-the-shelf hardware. I mean, to, to, to Keith's point, the P60 is still you need the specialized hardware, you need the GPUs and so forth. Um, now the the What's going on also is the optimization of this of the software for HEVC encoding, H.265 encoding is happening. Uh, so we're, we're going to see more and more advances there. Um, you know, DivX is one of the companies that's involved there, um, and others obviously. Uh, but we, we think that uh, we could get to a P60 um, sometime in, in you know in 2015, and that would make it actually possible to pro proliferate the encoding in real time. Um, but uh, we're not far. I mean, this is what we're talking about now. So uh, 4K P30, which we'll see with Netflix and, and Amazon, that's possible on, on, on regular hardware today. Nick, any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, we were doing this. Uh, Sony built an um, outside broadcast truck for, uh, for the World Cup earlier this year, and uh, we were broadcasting 60p um, within Brazil through, uh, through test systems. And I believe some of those uh, signals were sent off of satellites to, uh, to other parts of the world as well. So, um, you know, this, this really shows that, um, uh, that, it's, that it's possible today. But you were doing that off of Sony hardware in those trucks? Uh, mostly Sony hardware in those trucks and Sony cameras in the stadium. Right. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about um, what you guys see from, from let's call it the content production side. Um, and here, let's talk about we're, I guess let's talk about entertainment, meaning uh, you know Hollywood television, movies type stuff. We'll set sport, set live sports, the broadcast truck aside for one second. And let's just talk about typical um, uh, kind of on-demand content producers. Um, and uh, what are you guys seeing today in terms of um, sort of content provider, in a sense, support or adoption? Um, are they? Uh, you know, sort of as a matter of course, starting to encode new shows in 4K, and is there some kind of mezzanine format they're using? What, where, where are we today in terms of, I'll call it new content production, new episode gets produced, um, is it in 4K, is it not in 4K? Keith. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know the answer to that um, specifically. What I, what I will say is that I was surprised, so at CES, um, we were doing a demonstration uh, with uh, Comcast, and they were able to show a number of different shows that were shot in 4K that I didn't even realize were shot in 4K. And when I, when I asked them about it, they said, you'd be surprised at how much of the source is actually in 4K already. Um, I don't know what percentage that is. Obviously, they own NBC, and that's a large lineup of, of potential shows. Um, I think from the, I think from the um, you know, some of the, the media reports that have come out in terms of the, the early moves by DirecTV, where it's a couple dozen, I think, um, movies that are available in the, in the idea of getting to more than 100 by the end of the year, you know, given that this was only a few weeks ago, that there's a good amount of content out there. Is it, is it you know, everywhere? I don't think so, but I, I don't know the exact numbers. Sony would probably have a better answer. I mean, you've been working in the space for a long time. What's, what's your thoughts? How, what's, what's that library look like? But particularly also is how well established right now is the notion that Anything you shoot, 
you know, on a on let's call it a first run or you know high production value basis is is going to be shot in 4K. Are we already there? I think we're very very close. So pretty much there in uh, in the minds of many cinematographers and uh, uh, and filmmakers. Um, you know, as of today, you can go out and buy our 4K media player, um, uh, which as well as uh, supporting Netflix 4K um, and eventually Amazon 4K. Uh, it also has our own video unlimited 4K service on there, and that. Uh, has 245 uh, native 4K pieces on there, about 70 movies, 110 TV episodes, and uh, various other short-form content. Um, every episode of The Blacklist, every episode of Breaking Bad, every episode of uh, the Showtime show, Masters of Sex, all of those um, uh, natively shot in 4K and natively delivered via our OTT service to, uh, to your home. So, you know, that's, that's a pretty big start. Um, if you look at uh, what's going on in, uh, you know, in the production community right now, um, many uh, uh, production companies uh, switching over to, uh, to 4K equipment, um, uh, really for future-proofing as much as anything else, um, even if they're not in immediately um, showing the production in, in 4K. Um, they know that sooner or later, um, the uh, you know the market for that for that content is going to include 4K outlets. Um, so better to have that ready, have the raw files uh, ready, as well as the HD files that um, uh, that are going to be used immediately. Um, and then, uh, you know, we're big proponents of uh, of IMF and as a uh, as a mezzanine standard and uh, uh, as a way to. Um, uh, you know, regardless of 4K, as a way to simplify uh, the delivery of, uh, of different versions of uh, uh, of a piece of work, different um, uh, soundtracks, different metadata, etc. Uh, but uh, because of the uh, uh, benefits of that standardized format, uh, you know, we're we're pretty much insisting that um, uh, when Sony Pictures produces um, content, and that, like I said, there's about 100 movies now. Uh, from Sony Pictures in uh, in native 4K, uh, available in native 4K, um, that that uh, is delivered in IMF, and uh, uh, you know all of the workflow around IMF is uh, uh, you know is, is pretty robust now. So, Kanan, any thoughts? Sure. Um, I mean, the, the different studios, as uh, Sony Pictures and so forth, they have uh, catalogs of they can convert and can uh, can scan and so forth, and generate 4K 4K digital co digital uh, copies. Uh, but I I every studio have they have a different different setup. So it, and also some studios don't have any uh, 4K content either past or uh, or in, in production. Uh, but we see a lot of lot of content. I mean, I think we, we're going to see probably hundreds of uh, titles available in 2015 from different sort from the different uh, big big studios. Um, but also uh, as we open up the, the our platform, we've seen, we've seen a lot of people come from the independent uh, film that have a lot of content in, uh, filmed in 4K originally. Uh, we also saw, uh, see a lot of semi-professional uh, content, cooking shows, uh, sports, and so forth uh, that we see in people are filming in 4K. And recently, we've seen, uh, you know, obviously, you can see a lot of action sports that are filmed in 4K, uh, basically, almost UGC with GoPro and, and other. So I think the, 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 the world of content in 4K, um, you know, from, from the studios is, is growing. But also from the other sources, we see it uh, really, really growing um, even faster. Um, so one, I just wanted to, uh, two, two questions I know that I'll often come up in this uh, every time we're on a panel, um, just to address quickly. One, uh, actually Sandeep, who's going to join us today, um, we, can, we can touch on briefly, is some uh, remastering old content in 4K. Uh, actually, Sandeep was part of the team that worked a little bit on Star Wars. I know in terms of um, remastering that in 4K essentially by hand, um, frame by frame, presumably for next year, right? The new Star Wars launch, they're gonna remaster some of the previous versions in 4K as well for a, for a reissue. Um, any thoughts, maybe maybe we'll address this one to Nick on, you know, what I've heard from that from Sandeep and others is, you know, extremely in a sense, you know, time intensive, cost intensive process to go back and, and remaster some of that stuff um, in 4K. What do you think we'll see? Just very selective, you know, huge titles like like Star Wars coming out. Or are we going to see people being able to really reissue large pieces of libraries in 4K? 
Yeah, I think the you know the home vi home video business um, you know ever since it it started uh, 20, 20, 30 years ago, uh, a, a key component of that has been um, you know taking the much loved movies of, of previous years and bringing them up to date on the you know the most convenient format of of the day. And as uh, you know as years have gone on with uh, with DVD and with Blu-ray. Um, you know, it became very apparent that some of these older titles um, had to be restored before you could really put them onto, uh, especially onto a, a Blu-ray disc. Um, and that's just as true with, uh, with 4K, really even, even more true. Um, but, uh, you know, if you're a movie studio in the business of um, exploiting uh, a catalog, of, a deep catalog of titles, um, then you know that's that's what you need to do in order to uh, uh, you know to, to get people to uh, to buy those titles again in uh, uh, increasingly improved um, improved picture quality. So um, you know we, we have a lot of those movies on our service today. Things like uh, Lawrence of Arabia, which uh, you know I think it's well documented on the internet the um, incredible process that they went through to um, uh, clean each of the uh, right. negatives and. Uh, uh, you know, rescan it all, scan it to 8K, um, finish it in 4K for um, 4K theatrical and, and home video distribution, uh, and it's a you know it's a four-hour movie, so uh, that's that's a lot of work, it's a lot of frames, um, but uh, you know the results are just incredible if you see um, side by side comparisons of what the uh, what the masters look like um, when they got them out of the vault and the cleaned up uh, 4K version. Uh, you know, there's just details and colors there that uh, that you couldn't believe were uh, were in the uh, in the original prints. So, do you think the 4K Blu-ray uh, sort of will help boost that, Nick, in terms of maybe providing an additional business case or or rationale? You know, a sense of a more clear clear short-term path to monetization that will help drive some of that 4K remastering of titles um, versus if it was just you know an on-demand market. I, I certainly can't uh, can't harm those uh, you know the economic case for uh, for refinishing um, catalog movies in in 4K, but uh, you know I think that argument is uh, you know isn't isn't in doubt in any case okay. you know I think all of the major studios are um, looking at their catalog, looking at their um, uh, their best titles, and uh, either have a plan to um, to restore them and uh, finish them in 4K, or you know are already in the process of doing that. All right. So the other thing we always hear, maybe you know, if I don't mention, it, we'll probably always get this question: is in terms of um, you know post-production and editing tools. There's obviously been a gap, um, you know, for a couple of years in terms of, of uh, you know studios not having end-to-end -end 4K tools. And so um, I know an example that often gets thrown around. Maybe somebody will grab a microphone and say it is. Um, I think it might have been the Transformers or uh, movies like that where all the special effects were in 2K because there were no 4K tools. So um, one thing, and especially for the encoding guys here at the table, um, you know, is, is, is that a real issue or a real concern? Are, are consumers even gonna, gonna, you know, gonna sort of notice those things? Is that a video file issue um, only? Um, you know, but repeatedly we've heard that issue um, over the past couple of years of um, you know, effects not being done in 4K and, and what's that gonna mean for the 4K viability of that title? And, and, you're talking that, about, and you're talking about past, past yeah, stuff titles. that stuff that you know came out a couple years ago, where clearly it was it was done in, in say a 2K Max yeah. um, effects studio. I don't know. Um, I think technology can potentially you know as as uh, you know as Nick disclosed, like technology can go back and solve problems that we didn't know existed at, at the time. Whether or not that's going to be true or not, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't think it'll I don't think it'll hinder the industry though. There's enough content. Right. to be created. All so. right. Any thoughts on that, Nick? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it comes down to, um, uh, you know, the nature of CGI in, in the first place. You know, if you look at, um, uh, look at a movie like um, uh, Total Recall, the, you right. know, the 2012 remake of, uh, of Total Recall, um, we often use that for, uh, for picture quality demos and, uh, and comparison of 4K versus HD. Um, Clearly, a movie with a lot of CGI in it. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's set in the future, so clearly there's the, the CGI. Um, but it's it's really not that apparent which frames um, had to be uh, mastered in 2K because they're very rich in um, special effects, 
uh, and which ones were 4K because they were, you know, they were shot um, uh, mostly, you know, live with live. a with a camera, um, and you know that distinction between 2K and 4K throughout, you know, one and a half hour movie um, just isn't apparent in the, you know, the viewing enjoyment of the uh, of the movie, and you can see um, the 4K quality and uh, uh, benefit, um, you know, throughout the movie, even though there's uh, obviously, significant parts of it that uh, uh, that are CGI and had to be finished in 2K. Right. And you can see something similar, I think, in some of the demonstrations of the scaling of HD content on 4K right. TV sets, where I think everyone has this uh, the memory of the transition to HD and seeing you know standard definition video on bigger screens, uh, flat panels, and it was it was terrible for a while, uh, for quite a while. Right. Whereas I think this time the scaling functions of the TV sets themselves, taking an HD signal and, and, and putting it on a, a 65 inch, it actually looks quite good. Yeah, yeah um, and that's a differentiator amongst yeah. TV manufacturers. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we always say that our um, 4K image scaler is, uh, is better than our competitors. Um, and you know, we'd certainly challenge anyone to do that side-by-side uh, that -side test. So, Kanan, any, I mean, you have a lot of golden eyes, I know, down at, down at Divis. Yeah. Anything you're seeing in terms of this 2K uh, effect issue? Def definitely, the, the, uh, the technology today that's available, the algorithms for scaling are much, much better than we had seven, eight years ago. Uh, also, the processing power on these devices is much, much higher. Uh, you have quad cores and so forth that are on 50-inch on, you know, TVs that can do a lot more. Um, so, blending uh, the 2K into the 4K uh, at the at the processing level, at the uh, you know, and, and then at the viewing level, uh, made it made it so that it, it's really unnoticeable almost. Uh, some some of the works that we've seen. So let's talk, and we'll we're, we're to, we'll do a, uh, maybe one more round here, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, the last kind of elephant in the room I want to get to is is device support and playback. So the client side, if you will, we've talked a lot about the the kind of the the production side, but the device support. Um, obviously, we have Sony in the panel, but um, you know, there's there's still obviously some major issues in terms of um, the gr the broader connected TV market. Um, you know, again, things that were you know current generation of game consoles not really supporting 4K. Current generations of uh, internet set top boxes, by which I mean Roku, Apple TV, not really supporting 4K. Obviously, t current connected Blu-ray doesn't support 4K. Um, and so we really have smart TVs carrying, you know, sort of all of the water um, at this point. What do you guys see um, in terms of um, chipset support, device support? Obviously, you guys are much closer to sort of the real supply chains industry. Um, when are we going to start to see broad deployment of uh, a variety of consumer devices um, that support uh, 4K playback? Uh, Keith? Yeah, so I think it is definitely concentrated right now in the in the connected TV space, um, and that's that's a good thing in some ways, right? At least there's there's um, something there that can do it. Um, you know, we do see movement on the more traditional set top box, you know, pay TV side, where I think in 2015 you'll see set tops that are able to be deployed. You know, we've definitely gone through a, a basically a year of cycles on the chipsets themselves. Um, and so, you know, I think once that happens, then some of the more consumer kind of internet uh, set-top boxes will, will start to fall as well. It just takes, it takes time. Yeah. So real quick, and then we'll go on. Uh, so how many chipset providers do you see today supporting 4K? We've seen three or four. Three or four. Point. Okay. Uh, Neg, obviously, we know your views on, on the grand, uh, beauty of Sony televisions, but how about other Sony devices? Uh, PlayStation, PlayStation TV? Where, where are we at in terms of enabling the broader ecosystem around 4K? Yeah, so I can't really talk about PlayStation, but uh, certainly we are uh, the only company with um, a standalone 4K media player. Um, so you can take our 4K media player, uh, connect it through HDMI 2.0 to any recent 4K TV, not just Sony TVs. You can connect it with our competitors' TVs as well and uh, uh, use that media player um, not just for our Video Unlimited service with um, 250 pieces of 4K content, but you know it also has Netflix 4K and uh, will have Amazon 4K on it. So this is um, this is really that that box that um, uh, you know that uh, that you were talking about at the beginning. Uh, 
and you know, we're surprised that there aren't any others in the market right now, but uh, uh, pleased, you know, pleased that it's, it's just us for now. Can I? 4K uh, so, uh, client yeah. support. Sure, we, we've shown at uh, CES at NAB this year, um, you know, our, our software really running on, uh, playback software running on multiple uh, chipsets. Uh, definitely the TV guys, um, MSTAR, Marvell, um, others, and also Qual Qualcomm, uh, and also on the set -top box side, Broadcom, um, ST Micro, and, and others. Uh, so th those are ready as, uh, you know, um, I think the 2014 has been the year of chipsets, and uh, we'll see more TVs and uh, mobile phones uh, with 4K support in 2015. Well, thanks for everyone. I know we're, uh, we're kind of right at time. Feel free to come up after with questions. One quick question. So just for the group, uh, the question is, is, is basically, is VR the next screen um, uh, in, in, that can help drive 4K? Any, any thoughts, Elemental? Have you done any playing around with VR? We haven't yet. Okay. So you know, 24, out, 24 months out is a little bit, bit far for us. Um, but could it happen? Sure. Yeah, I don't know if the Project Morpheus team are looking at, uh, at 4K, but uh, certainly anything like that. Um, you know, requires um, the most real-looking uh, resolution, and uh, uh, clearly, 4K could be could be one of the tools for that. So uh, I hope it does. I hope it is one of the things that energizes the 4K market. Okay. All right, great question. Thanks, yeah, thanks everyone thank for your time.